So hi. Hi. Um, what's your name? Lamia. 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 Okay. Is that an Arabic name? Or? Yeah, I made it up. Okay, I didn't what make it mean? up. I googled it. Okay. Oh, I found, you. I found you, it on Google. So you changed your name. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Right. We're not going to go into what the original name is. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We'll um, leave it as that. But can I ask what was the reason behind changing it? I became Muslim. Okay, right. I've converted, reverted. Yeah, I was hearing about this um, convert, revert. Is it revert is the correct term? Or I the believe term? so, yes. But others will disagree and say convert. And what's the reason behind that? Because I believe that we are born Muslim. Okay, right. So then you, you believe that you're kind of going back to, to Islam. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. That's nice. Um, what age were you when you converted? Initially 13. Okay, right. But I, it's easy to say 16 because I kind of retook my shahada and then that was when I started to cover mm. and actually became Muslim, if that makes sense, rather than just took my shahada and just said cool words and that was it. So. Okay, so you, that age you had a bit more understanding and a bit more... Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I wouldn't say became Muslim on impulse. Yeah. I think it was a conscious decision, but it wasn't something that I was actively living until no, yeah. I was 16. No, I understand, yeah, yeah. And what do you mean by cover? I started wearing hijab. Oh, okay, right, right. So oh, actually, sorry, I, I actually yeah. started to cover and like be oh. Muslim, praying, learning, the whole shebang. Okay, no, I understand, yeah, yeah. And would you say it's quite hard then at the age of kind of, well, as a teenager growing up, trying to be Muslim? Or trying to be a good Muslim? It was because I was hiding it. Okay, right. So I didn't tell my family that I was Muslim, I think, until I was about 18. Oh, uh, okay, fair So enough. I hid a lot of it. And then, funnily enough, they actually found out how old I was on YouTube. Because I'd done a YouTube video about it. <laughs> <laughs> so they had no idea. And oh. I just confessed everything, basically. Oh, fair enough, fair enough, yeah. So. yeah. Oh. And... What were your reasons behind kind of reverting at that age of 13? Because it's quite, yeah, it's quite young, uh, isn't it? I mean, there's a straightforward answer would be yeah. without being offensive. Yeah. Um, a lot of my family are Christian. Okay. So I was brought up around an atheist parent and then Christian family. Neither made sense to me. I always believed in a high power, heaven, hell, God, devil, all of that. Um, but Christianity wasn't something that ever made sense to mm -hmm. me. And I think I had a lot of questions that could never be answered. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that I was a Christian, because I never was. Um, but I would go to church with like my cousins or my, my grandmother. Um, and then it was kind of when I went to secondary school, I found out that Islam was a thing, mm -hmm. Muslims were a thing. I grew up on the nation of Islam, which is very different. And I just kind of thought it was a bit like a, a cult thing for black people, because that was what my dad used to follow in jail. Okay, right, um, yeah. And then, yeah, I found out about Muslims and then was told a lot of stories. And every question that I had, I went to the mosque and they were all answered. Okay, nice. And literally decided to take my shahada on the spot. <laughs> oh, wow. Literally. That's what I said. I don't know if it was on impulse or if it was just the thing where I was just like, right, okay, I found answers. I'm happy. But um, yeah, I would probably say that it became a thing at 16. Okay. No, okay. Nice. Yeah. No, fair enough. Because I know um, religion, when you enter religion and you, and you decide to kind of, you know, make that decision, sometimes it is a step of faith as well that, that you need. I mean, would you agree? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And what was, what was life like before that kind of growing up? Did you grow up in Croydon or? Mm. Nice. So I'm originally from Croydon. Okay. Um, south London. <laughs> yeah, south. Raised in south. Um, life was okay. Okay. Just normal or? <laughs> okay. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't say normal, it was okay. Yeah, no, fair enough. And um, how did your family respond then? Because you said they found out through YouTube. Um, what were their initial kind of thoughts and how did they react? 
I think the easiest going were my siblings. They didn't mm. really care. Oh, fair enough. Um, I think my brothers were quite happy because it meant that I, won't, I wouldn't be going out, wouldn't be having boyfriends, all that stuff. <laughs> um, my little sister at one point decided that she wanted to be more similar, so, but obviously it was awkward because she was like 11. Oh, right. So, yeah. um, my dad was really accepting of it and was a bit annoyed that I kept it from him, but he was really open to it. I think my mum. She just, I think she obviously only knew the bad of mm. it, so she was a bit concerned. Okay. Um, my nan absolutely hated it as a strong Christian woman, absolutely <laughs> hated it. And I think the rest of my family just kind of thought it was a phase. All right, fair enough, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, at that age, you kind of go through phases, but mm. obviously not everything is a phase, yeah. No, <laughs> it definitely wasn't a phase. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I kept it from them because I know how strong my family can be. Yeah. And I knew nothing. So I knew I'd be questioned and they would be on me and I wouldn't be able to give them the answers. So. No, fair enough, yeah. It's yeah. my little secret. <laughs> no, I get that. Especially when you're, you're learning for yourself at that age as well. Mm. Yeah, so you don't need all the questions coming at you and yeah. The challenges. Yeah, that's I it. I ready yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say your dad converted as well? No, oh, no. All oh, right. No. So it, when he was in jail, he read up about it and was following. He says the mm. nation of Islam, obviously the Malcolm X lot and that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a bit more cultish. It's a bit more different. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe that's offensive to say cults. Maybe not. More like, like um, a black power? <laughs> yeah, it's more of a... Like a movement? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he followed that throughout jail and throughout that period of time that he was in there. Mm. But came out and nothing ever came of it. Oh, fair enough, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, fair enough. And how did you find getting into like horses and equestrian? Did I say it right? Yes, equestrian. <laughs> um, my background with horses also came through my dad. Nice. So I grew up with horses. I grew up around horses and had horses as a child. Okay. Um, it was something that my dad was into. He used to breed horses and he had a lot of friends and a lot of gypsy friends that all had horses. So I was kind of born and thrown into it. Nice. But it worked in my favour because yeah. it's a passion of mine. So... Oh, nice. So I started. And what, what age was that, though, that you kind of started? And... Um, I think I was like as young as three, because wow. that's the, the youngest I've seen, like, pictures of me on horses. I'm about three. Yeah. Um, and then I had my first horse at seven or eight. I had a pony. Okay, nice. Is so that one purchased by your, by your dad? Or yeah. One? Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, it was by my dad. So, yeah, it kind of started from then, and then it had been... On and off, obviously, throughout the years, and now it's quite stable. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you like about horses? What's there not to like? Because I, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've been horse riding a couple of times. Have you? Yeah. In, not in the UK? No, in Jamaica. And I think I went to Jamaica twice. Maybe it was only Jamaica, actually. I feel like I have been in the UK, but maybe as a kid. Is it? Okay. Yeah. I feel like horse riding in the UK and horse riding abroad is two different horse ridings. What's the difference then? The UK horses are a lot more tamed. Okay, right. A bit more boring. Right. When you're yeah. abroad, they're wild. <laughs> boring? Yeah, because UK horses are... <laughs> Isn't it good to be tamed? Yes and no. <laughs> I think obviously if you're a beginner, yes. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, you're not challenged enough. By okay, UK, right. like riding school horses, compared to when you go abroad during the deep end, you're in the thick of it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's two different things. Because yeah, my experience is like you know they they sold us this package and we were galloping along the like back roads and the mountains and then my horse just kind of like stopped for grass. I almost got flung off the horse. It just did like an emergency stop. <laughs> yeah, see in the UK you probably would have to have like a few riding lessons before you even get to that oh, stage. Oh, I see. Okay, right, They're right. very like particular in the UK of like riding and your ability and what we're going to allow you to do for health and safety reasons and animal rights and there's a lot more 
precautions. Yeah. Whereas when you're abroad, they're like, just get on the horse and go. <laughs> if you fall, you fall. Just bring back the horse. Don't die. You're fine. Just go. No, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. And what is your favourite kind of like discipline within horse riding? Like, what's your best? Oh, who's talking you that word? <laughs> <laughs> That's from Sarah. <laughs> oh, of course it was. <laughs> um, probably jumping. Okay. Um, I would probably say more cross country hunting than show jumping. Okay, right. So you do a bit of everything. No, I don't. What would you say you like specialising or kind of concentrate on? Um, preferably jumping. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm not too keen on. There's another thing called dressage. Okay. Which is where the mid-hall dance kind of. All oh, right. Um, I mean, there's there's quite a few different disciplines with horse riding, but I prefer jumping. Okay, right. And wait, first off, sorry, I have to ask, how do you, how do you make a horse dance? <laughs> um, training. Just a lot of training. It's, I mean, it's not dancing, like, they're not, like... Like, yeah, it's no. like you know, like, when they're... <laughs> they do, like, they're little like, steps. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, it's all training. Like, I, I don't really know the ins and outs, I'm not going to lie. But is it cruel? Um, it can be. Some okay, people right. do train cruelly. Mm. But there are ways to... It sounds, it sounds really weird. There are ways to ask the horse okay. of things in teaching. And, like, teach a dog to sit. You know, you push its bum down, sit. Yeah. There are ways to, to encourage and to train a horse to do that. Yeah, no, fair enough. Without battering it. Okay, fair enough. And I've had a look at your Instagram. Okay. Obviously, research purposes. and Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I saw that you had kind of like, it looked like a genuine connection with the horses. Yeah. So would you, can you explain that a little? Like, how, does, how does that work? How do, you, how do you have a connection with a horse? How do you kind of... Um, does it take a long time to build that? I know it's a weird question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm an animal person anyway. Okay. So, I don't want to sound cliche and be like, it comes natural. <laughs> but I think it's just listening. Okay, right. You kind of got to listen, but also allow yourself to be listened to. Okay. That's if that deep. makes sense. Yeah. Was that a bit too, like... <laughs> no, it's kind, of, it's kind of deep. Yeah, I kind of understand it. Yeah, yeah. so like, I feel like with horses there has to be a mutual respect yeah there has to be there's a, a saying i don't know if i'm going to say this right so don't quote me on it but it's like mm. with a male horse a boy horse you know you kind of tell it what to do and it does it for you whereas with a female horse you kind of have to ask her okay right. male and female horses are two different okay right calibers of horses so like for example you probably saw my connection with my own horse which is a female okay right and with her there has to be a lot of respect between us because she will try to kill me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like i have to build that connection where i have to listen i have yeah. to find out why is she upset today why is she in a bad mood and also allow her to understand i'm in a bad mood because you're peeing me off okay like, there's that <clears throat> ground and you feel like they they read that from you as well yeah they can uh, they can yeah. feel a lot and that's why they're so good with therapy because they can hear your mm. heart they can wow. feel your they can feel everything wow that's amazing they're very sensitive no that's good that's yeah no it's a lot to to learn and to digest yeah. it's good what's your horse's name jigsaw okay <laughs> and how did you get the name jigsaw i got her with the name jigsaw all oh, right right fair enough yeah. would yeah. i have chose the name for her no but i mean it suits her because she is from the saw movie um <laughs> but yeah jigsaw okay see i thought it would be jigsaw because of her pattern because i did see her pattern maybe mm. i don't really know the story behind it too dark but did she have a pattern when, she, when you got her yeah okay right. she but, i mean she has changed color yeah but she yeah she's always had the spots okay nice and what kind of horse is she because there's different kind of horses yeah different breeds yeah so her breed is a breed called Appaloosa. Okay. Which is a Native American, you know, when you see cowboys and Indians, she's the Indian horses. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, she's Native American. Okay, nice. So yeah, maybe her ancestors were, were doing quite a lot in the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now she's mentally insane. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she, is she a bit kind of emotional sometimes, a bit crazy? Okay. And what's the worst kind of thing she's done? Has she ever thrown you off or injured you in any way? Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about it? Uh, she threw me off about a month ago. Oh. Because she saw her in shadow. <laughs> yeah. And I've grazed all my arm. Probably still got the scar, but yeah, I grazed all my arm up. Oh, no. And then in February, I actually had a bad incident where we was jumping and she decided that she was going to buck, you know, like buckaroo. <laughs> Is yeah. that where they throw up the back? And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she did that times three and oh, I no. flew high in the air. <laughs> but I have this thing that when I'm falling off, I try to land on my feet. Because I'm... <laughs> trying to be a stunt, stunt landing. I'm always fearful of getting trod on. So I always try to land on my feet, which yeah. I did. I oh, landed, nice. but I didn't let go of her. So she yanked me. Uh. And I tore my ligament, oh, my ankle. No. So I was out of work for about... Three months and I was on crutches. Wow. So I think that's the worst injury I've had from her so far. Yeah. Cause no, I was, I can, that's quite bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you go and see her while you were on crutches? And um, I did, mm. but probably like twice in the three months because I couldn't get up there because I couldn't drive. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And it's really slippery and it's on a hill. so. No, fair enough. Yeah. And whereabouts do you... Um, Kind of, keep how do I say? Yeah, keep your horses, yeah. Croydon. Okay. Is that like in the farm, yeah, farmland or something like that? Yeah, so she's actually on a private, um, we call it a yard. So like mm. a private yard, private stable. Um, and she lives in the fields. So she okay, doesn't nice. actually have a stable. She just mm. lives out all year round. No, fair enough. And can I ask, do you know what it is between like travellers and horses? Why do they always have horses and love horses? Or? I think it's part of their, their, <coughs> their culture. Like, okay, right. That's before cars, that's how they used to travel. That's true, yeah. Horse and cart. And they would have their, I actually don't know what it's called, but like, you know, their, it's like a little dome, the wheels. Yeah, and yeah. And they have their, their horse and carriage. Yeah, and they still so, do sometimes. Yeah, some of yeah. them, like the really traditional lot. But um, yeah, I think it's part of their culture. It's still part of their tradition. Okay, right, fair enough. Even yeah. if they don't pull their carriages. <coughs> Yeah, because I, I did see it the other day, um, and I mean, do horses mind what the ground conditions are like? I don't know if I could say they mind, they, they can definitely perform differently Yeah. with different grounds. Obviously, if it's harder or softer or slippery, it has an effect on their whole performance. Okay, right. And how do you make a horse jump? Um, You ask it. <laughs> um, but after, after you've trained the horse to jump, do you yeah. have like a signal or something? Yeah, so to... it's your positioning, your mm. direction, and usually before you do the jump, you do use your legs. or you make mm. like I tend to talk to my horse a lot, so I kind of encourage okay. her. Um, so yeah, it's literally asking, like, now. Okay, fair enough. Or they just jump like my horse. And how old is your horse? Uh, she's 17. 17, yeah. So she's quite old. Yeah. Middle-aged. <laughs> and what's kind of like, how long do they live as well? Um, I know they can like live up to well into their 30s. All right. So the oldest I've ever known is 38. Wow. Um, and where Jigsaw is now, her like best friend, he's actually 30. So, I mean, they can, they can live for a Fair amount of time. Oh, that's good, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, d I didn't know that at all. Um, I have to ask, with like stuff like horse racing and stuff like that, is there quite a lot of cruelty that happened in those industries? And yeah. Do you know anything off the top of your head, kind of like what happened? Um, horse racing in particular, yes. Um, the horses are usually very young oh, when right. they're taken into racing. Um, I actually found out quite recently that with a lot of the racehorses to enable them to breathe better, they actually um, puncture a hole in their airways. Wow. To allow more air to get into, into their lungs. And I found yeah. this out with my friend's ex racehorse. Um, she had a health issue. We took her to the vets and they put yeah. a scope down her throat and they said, oh, she's, she's had this done. 
Wow. And I had never heard of it before until then. She was like, yeah, this is what they do to a lot of the racehorses to enable them to get more oxygen in, to be able to run for longer, I assume. Yeah, yeah. So that, that sounds quite bad, yeah. I'd say I'd, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have a clue if anything like that was happening, to be honest. Yeah. You wouldn't know because it's internal as well, yeah. even as someone who knows horses. Oh, jeez. Are there other people that identify like you kind of in the industry with horses and... Yeah. You get I mean, I've dis only discovered them the past year or two. Okay, right. But, yeah, there's quite a few of us now. Is that mu like Muslim females? Yeah. All right. We've got our first um, Muslim hijabi jockey in the UK now. Nice. Who, she did it for us. <laughs> So that's uh, Khadija Mella. Um, she's an acquaintance. I wouldn't say she's a friend, but like we speak, like we know each other. She yeah. she got that title for us. So I think she won in 2019. Nice. So there's her. Um, I mean, I don't really know many in the UK, but I know like we do exist. I just don't know of many of us in the UK. Oh, fair enough. And, and what did she win exactly? Um, so she won a Magnolia Cup in racing. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So she came first place. What, what is a Magnolia Cup? Um, it's an all-woman's charity race. Um, but it's at the um, Goodwood, which is a big, famous uh, racing track. Um, who it, is it run by? Yeah, it's Goodwood. I don't think it's anybody else. Goodwood. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she won that. Back in 2019, nice. um, first of her kind. Is that is that something that anyone can enter or? Uh, yes and no. Obviously, you have to know how to ride. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can sign up to ride for the Magnolia race. And is it actually like a race? Like yeah. it's by speed. Yeah. Okay. It's an actual race. Yeah. Like it's, I think it's even on TV. It goes in the newspapers. Like it's an actual horse race All right. and is then afterwards then the other normal races where you see the normal races go on but it's yeah. all in the same day that sounds pretty cool would you be interested in doing something like that i was meant to be in it this year all right but oh no is it because of the injury I had the injury and oh, then no. two months after the injury i broke my hand how did you break your hand horses <laughs> <laughs> Is that getting thrown off again? No, I tried <laughs> to save a horse. How? Um, she got her head stuck and she was stuck and she was panicking. I didn't want her to break her neck. So I tried to take the head collar. I tried yeah. to just rip it off of her head so she okay. wouldn't break her neck. But obviously in her panic, she crushed my hand into a wall and oh, done no. all my hand, my knuckle. I mean, technically, you kind of saved the head from hitting the wall, so... Technically, I didn't, because after she did that, I let go, and then she actually ripped the door off the hinges. Oh, wow. But, I mean, better that than her neck. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take a bit of credit. Oh, fair enough, yeah. You saved her. <laughs> how, how strong are horses, then? Very. Extremely strong? Yeah. For, like, the power of, like, eight humans, or...? I mean, I don't know how to calculate that. But, obviously, <laughs> different horse sizes, different breeds, different powers but we know that regardless they're strong Even yeah a little pony is really strong so. okay right right so I'm, I'm pretty sure you can feel the force when you kind of ride the horse and yeah and then even just their weight movements. alone like my horse is like 600 kgs wow. when you're dealing with that mm. you don't really so when because i've seen videos where the horse falls on the person does that ever happen to you, anything like that? or A pony, but it didn't fall on me, it rolled on me. Okay. But, right. <laughs> I mean, it happens. Because I can imagine 600 kilos, like, falling on you yeah. would do a lot of damage, yeah. yeah. And break a bone. A few, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough. Um, you founded, would you say it's a company? Yeah. Yeah? And what, what was the name of that? The Urban Equestrian Academy. Nice. South London. <laughs> and can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, so the UEA, for short, is a sister company to the Urban Equestrian Academy, which originated in Leicester. Okay. Um, so 
the Urban Equestrian in Leicester started six or seven years ago now, um, primarily focusing on the urban community, inner city mm. people, those that have the least access to horse riding, to horses, or anything to do with equestrian. Yeah. Um, he founded that seven years ago um, as a black Muslim man himself who was into horses and found that it was difficult for him. No. Um, I came across him two years ago mm -hmm. and it was already something that I wanted to do growing up in the equestrian world and never really fitting in. Um, I was always kind of looking for a way to be able to start my own riding club or start my own riding school or have something that I could run to basically be inclusive. Yeah. Um, then when I came across him, I reached out and basically said, can I franchise? Like, can I create a branch using your name because you're already established mm -hmm. and starting in London? And we spoke and literally he was okay with it. We're really tight to this day. And obviously we work hand in hand. Um, so I actually run the Urban Equestrian in London, but I don't have my own facilities just yet. Yeah. Um, so I actually rent a stables and horses from a riding school called Kingston Riding Centre. Okay, nice. Um, so far, so good. I've been running for two years and um, we're doing all right. You love it? Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And where do you, where is that? Sorry, Kingston? Um, it's in Chesington now because the, the riding okay. centre had moved during COVID, but it yeah. is in Chesington, <laughs> but they are called Kingston Riding Centre. Okay, right. And where can we find you online for that? Um, that page? Um, so all of the social medias, everything is under UEA South London. Okay. Not UAE, UEA. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone does that, UAE, and I'm like, no, we're not the Arab Emirates, we're <laughs> Urban Equestrian. And so the, it was originally set up to kind of work with urban communities and, and young people who, I guess, wouldn't have that chance normally. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like a very good, you know, idea how do you how do you kind of work with the communities and, and young people um so it is just more so working as i said with anybody that has the least access to horses mm. i am open to anybody even if you can ac access a horse whenever yeah. it's still entirely open to you but it's more so for the beginners the you know more in the communities that not only wouldn't be able to afford it, but wouldn't know where to start, wouldn't know where to go, but can come with us and feel comfortable with the way that they look, the way that they are, and know that you're in a safe space. Like, we're, we're open. The way I look, <laughs> the way half of our volunteers and our instructors look, we're all Muslim, we're all Asians, we're Arabs, we're white, we're black. When you look around, everybody's here. So mm. it's, it is a safe space for them. Um, and we just base it on that, even if there are parents that can't afford to actually send their child to come, we, we've we created networks now where we can actually help to fund that. Well, and we create an option that if you want to pay us back, you can pay us back. And if you can't, then we're happy to do as much as we physically can, mm. um, which isn't always much, but we can facilitate to saying you know what come through for free oh that's brilliant that's i think that's really nice yeah, yeah we that's try really nice. we try <laughs> <laughs> no that's good <laughs> and where does that passion come from then it's just kind of your, your own personal experience and more so yeah and i think my own personal experience good and bad mm. so in the good way without me having horses i probably could have been in a very different lifestyle be a very different person yeah. growing up where i grew up in fort and heath it got me out so there was that side it kept me mentally sane when there was a lot of things i was dealing with i was able to turn to horses or animals as a whole yeah and then i think yeah and then on the negative side of where i wasn't actually accepted as a child simply because i'm mixed race because i wasn't white 
because I had a black dad or because later on I had a hijab on my head, just because of that I wasn't accepted. So it's I wanted to create a space that regardless, we're open, like you are okay to be here. That's nice, yeah. And with that, with that acceptance, was that kind of like people in the community or school or like that people, you said you weren't accepted? Riding schools. Oh, riding schools. Okay, riding right. schools, horsey people. I mean, in, it was always a, like a taboo thing to go to school and it's like, you ride horses. Where do you <laughs> ride horses? Like we're in Croydon and it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was, it was the horse. It is the equestrian environment that yeah. is gotten a lot better. I would say over the past two or three years. Mm. However, we still are a minority. We still are a two percentage, if not less, in the horse world. So yeah. we are weird to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand that. I know predominantly, I'd, I'd, I would imagine it's a, it's a rich person's kind of... Elitist sport. That's it, yeah, elitist sport. That's a good way of putting it. Um, and I guess that's been your experience as well, hasn't it? So you're, you're here to kind of break down the barriers and, and let people from the community in and make it normal mm. to some people. Build a bridge. Oh, that's good, yeah. And it's like, you know, we have like loads of little slogans that we like throw out and we're like, we're guiding a new generation. Nice. Um, like, we are the community for the community. Like, we are, I'm not here to overtake or overrun anything I'm literally here to to build that bridge to know that there are opportunities and the benefits in it or if it's just a one-off experience it's still there would you say that you face any challenges um growing up as a Muslim woman yeah you would yeah can you give me any examples though I've was been it more attacked like a, a couple of times been what sorry I've been attacked a couple of times are you serious hmm. wow how did that, is that just a random attack? Mm. So like a, like a hate crime, religious hate crime kind of thing? Yeah. But it was, the, <laughs> it was so stupid. She basically tried to set me on fire, but it didn't work. Jesus. So wow. she tried to squeeze hand sanitizer on me and tried to throw a match. Wow. But we got to her before that happened, but it was literally random. She was outside of bookies, I was outside the corner shop, waiting, because it was a really small corner shop. And yeah, it was just random. So you didn't know her at all? No, she was a, a junkie outside oh. the, the, the So bookies. was she like shouting? She was silent, and that's what was weird. It wasn't oh, wow. like, it wasn't like yeah. a thing that it was like, we was going back and forth. It literally just happened. Wow. So that's probably because because your appearance to be to yeah be at the time I was dressed woman. very differently so I did um, wear the dress called a jilbab, which is basically the one cloth that goes from the head all the way down. Okay, right. Um, so it looks a lot more Islamic. Mm. Um, but yeah, that was uncalled for. But yeah, that happened. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like the second time was near Crystal Palace Football Stadium. I wouldn't say it was more of an attack, it was more of a man, obviously, trying to intimidate me because of the way I was dressed. Wow. Um, he was obviously drunk under the influence or whatever, rolled up because of the football game. But, um, yeah, they're the two worst ones that I can think of. The rest have all just been verbal rubbish. I mean, that doesn't make it okay. Yeah. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, but, you not... know, I know it sounds really bad, but it's yeah. like, it's a part of it, mm. unfortunately you kind of know, I guess it's like growing up black, you know at some point in your life you're going to receive racism or mm -hmm. Asian or Arab, you know at some point someone is going to throw some sort of racism at you. Mm. As a Muslim, I think I was always mentally prepared to not only be attacked, but to be stopped at the airport, to be accused of terrorism, to be accused of things. I think yeah. it just comes as the package of being I Muslim. Understand. Yeah, yeah. Because of the media and the world. Yeah, it's it's sad to think that it's still kind of stereotypes and, and prejudice that happen. Yeah. Do, do you find it different at the airports as well? Like personally. Mm. Okay. Right. Yeah. 
as in they're trying to like just search and they'll accuse you okay right right yeah they'll detain you and accuse you just under suspicion and it's legal wow under section seven it is legal for them to have an assumption of you because of the way you look so in my case my name in my passport is very british it's not british it's very not muslim yeah and i didn't have a muslim so you know it's 10 years so i didn't have a hijab in my picture but yet i've come to the airport in a full veil where are you going mm. and they are allowed to detain you under suspicion and they're allowed to hold you and question you and take your prints and take your dna and search you and Seriously. they're allowed to do that and there's nothing you can do about it i think yeah wow that's that's a lot that's a lot to process because i know yeah <laughs> It's, it's quite disgraceful, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I think they are trying to create a law to mm. now to create more human rights. Mm. Um, because when you are held under counterterrorism, you have no rights. You have no right to remain silent. You, you lose everything. Okay, right. And it's the same as being arrested as well under, under terrorism. Yeah. I think it was extended, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like one of the the highest things where your rights are Going forget, out about yeah. <laughs> forget about it forget about it it doesn't exist so yeah. yeah that will i actually remember being told um somewhere where i worked expect it to happen at some point and i was like why though like, i don't even do nothing weird on my phone like i'm mm. not even that sort of muslim that i'm into like i'm free flowing <laughs> yeah. yeah i expect it to happen no, that's bad and yeah. it's not because of you it's just ignorance it's just other people's prejudice and they act on it, yeah. Mm. That's, I think that's disgraceful, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say. Not, not, on, not on your <laughs> no, part no, of things, no. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I mean, I think you just have... Has, has it given you a tougher skin then? Mm. Or have you always had kind of like a tougher skin growing up? Um, I think I've always had a tougher skin. Mm. I think being Muslim has taught me to not take everything so personally. It's taught me a lot of patience. It's taught me to not always jump to assumptions or accuse people. You have to be a bit more, and I guess that's what Islam teaches anyway. But yeah, I was very impatient. I was very rapid all the time. And I think it calmed me down a lot. So yeah, it didn't just create thicker skin. It also just... Kind of mellowed you, changed, mellowed relaxed me. you, yeah. I have a better thought process. I think things through before just sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. And do these experiences and kind of interactions, you know, kind of branch out to like the wider public and social media? Do you get kind of people messaging you weird stuff or anything like that? Seriously? Wow. Any examples? It's mainly Muslims, actually. Oh, that wow. message weird stuff. Like what? Really weird stuff. <laughs> Could have a man, obviously not from the UK, who wants to get married, and they will like obsess over you in the DMs. Wow. Um, then you can have the far opposite of that, where it's a Muslim bashing you. Okay, because right. Because the way you're deciding to cover, or the way you're posting things, and that's not what you're meant to be doing. I mean, it's, it's rare now that I get any abuse from, like, anyone else. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it, the messages do usually come from Muslims. Is that them being, like, judgmental? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. More time, yeah. You used to be on YouTube. I did. <laughs> what kind of content? Um, can I be categorised? I don't think so. Okay. Was it more like so, blogging? yay and nay I tried to I always try to be a bridge mm. um, I tried to build a bridge between the realities of taboo topics of being a Muslim from a non-Muslim household mm. and being a convert, I think at the time, this, this was, we're going back seven, eight years ago now. 
okay. when I started. Yeah. So it was when everyone was starting up the YouTube hype and it was becoming a thing. I feel like the knowledge of things back then wasn't as high as they are now because you can research anything through TikTok or Twitter or wherever. It was a very tabu situation for people to, to see converts, to see people that don't have Muslim families. And I would basically do vlogs and do videos on my life and what it was like for me. As much as I'm a Muslim and I prayed and I did everything, Christmas Day is still a thing in my household. Mm. Alcohol is still a thing, pork is still a thing in my household. Although I don't indulge in it, yeah. I still have to live with it day to day. And the reality of it is, what's the lesser of two evils? Do I not involve myself with Christmas Day with my family and completely isolate myself and then my family hate Islam and hate me and it creates that separation? Or do I not celebrate Christmas with them, but help them make sure that the food that they have there is halal and I, I cook it for them and I play my part and I sit with them as a family, not so much in the celebration, but I spend that day with them because that's the only day that we get together. Mm. Um, and I just broke down like loads of situations like that, like having dogs uh, as a Muslim is like a, a big thing. Is it? Yeah, there's, a, there's different opinions. It yeah. really depends on what opinion people go by. Okay. Um, but dogs are not very clean animals. Oh, right, so it is um, cleansiness. Yeah. So, yeah, so there are things of different opinions on having a dog living within the house. Mm -hmm. um, I had a dog that lived <laughs> in the house that I okay, had had right. since I was like 11, 12. Yeah. And I used to vlog it and I used to talk about it. So now what am I meant to do? As a Muslim, I've become Muslim. I have a dog. Am I meant to abandon him? Am I to just take him and give him away and then my family go crazy? Like... How do I deal with a situation like that that you don't have to deal with? Yeah. And I just used to do loads of things like that and topics like that. How do I get a family that don't know Islam to understand that me as a teenager, I'm not lost and confused. I've actually studied and I've actually researched and I've actually done a lot <laughs> yeah. to know that this is what I want to do. How do you convince an 80-year-old Christian woman that this is what I'm doing I'm, and I'm not being radicalised. Yeah, no, I understand. So yeah. that was, my whole YouTube was based around taboo, realistic situations. <laughs> Did it go good for me? <clears throat> no. Why? Because of the ignorance of the Muslims. They, okay, they right. didn't get it. Okay. Um... I got bashed a lot for it, publicly and online. Wow. Um, I had created a decent platform for myself, so I was recognised in the streets. I couldn't really go out without being recognised. Couldn't just walk into a mosque and not know that I'm going to get recognised. Um, and, yeah, it, I think about three or four years in, it got a lot my mental health deteriorated and it was literally a decision between me or social media. I see, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I made a very conscious decision that it was going to be me and I deleted everything and I came off of everything and I wouldn't say became shut off but I wasn't willing to conversate with anybody in, in public or have a conversation with you to where I've gone, why I've gone will I be coming back? It wasn't a conversation. It never existed in my head. <laughs> no, fair enough. But I mean, I feel like you, you've kind of, you've kind of created a platform that's necessary, if, if, if I can say that. In hindsight, would I have done things differently? Yes. Would I have deleted the platform? No. Mm -hmm. Even though I do feel like at that moment in time, it was very necessary. I think now with the person that I am now, I would have done things differently and I probably would have never have deleted and I probably would have never have, I probably might have had a break, gone away for a little bit and come back, mm. but what's done is done. Would you restart a platform to kind of be that voice for, for young people that are struggling in situations that you, you kind of grew up in? 
I'd love to say yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, probably no. Mm. Not that I, without sound, not sounding arrogant, not that I don't think I could do it or I don't have the capability to do it. Yeah. I quite like <laughs> the way things are now. Is it more like having the peace than kind of not having... Yeah, it's just not the ongoing battle, the ongoing mm. explaining arguing even if I didn't give them time of day seeing people arguing in comments is draining yeah having people constantly have conversations to you about you and to you about what's going on is just it's too much I like the little platform that I've got now where it's just the horses and it's just <laughs> la da there's nothing too serious it's just that no fair enough yeah so and when because I, because I'm not, I'm not personally in the public eye. Mm. I'm not. I don't really have a big platform. And mm -hmm. um, would you would you say that people that do have a platform and put themselves in the public eye, when when all these comments happen because they do, mm -hmm. well, you know, when you go on Instagram posts, you see all these comments and everyone loves to talk about other people's lives and etc. Yep. Um, does the creator does it affect them? Yeah, it does. I don't care what anybody says. They can sit there and say it doesn't bother me. It does. Even if it's not long term, but just for that moment, it kind of burns you a bit. It does. And you see everything. Mm. As much as people go, oh, you know, like, I don't care. And you do see the comments. Although you don't give them time of day, you do see it. Yeah. Everything. Every DM, every comment, every video that's made about you, that's, that you're tagged in, every podcast that they've mentioned your name in, you see it all. You just make a choice to react or not. Yeah, yeah. And it, it does, it gets frustrating because sometimes when it comes from people that you don't even know, you're like, wait, why don't you like me? <laughs> what, what have I done? Why, why do you actually hate me? Why yeah. are you actually taking your time out of your day to, 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 to bash me like this, to talk about me like this? It's like, oh. And it, I think it's worse when it's someone that you quite like. And then you see it and you're like, oh, wow, I was yeah. a fan of you. <laughs> <laughs> quite liked you. <laughs> but no, yeah, yeah, it is disheartening and it is, yeah. No, I can, I can understand that, yeah. I think a lot of people forget that people have feelings and they, they just hide behind their profiles and, and say whatever they want in the comments. And Social media creates comfortability. They think that because they follow you, they know your life and they're entitled to a say in your life and mm. they're entitled to not only just saying what they want, but it's, well, you put yourself out there. So, of course, I can comment. So, have you been on the weight loss journey or what would you call it? <laughs> so, yeah, as I said, I'm going to be brutally honest. Yeah. Um, I definitely capped a little bit when I said it was a weight loss journey. It okay. wasn't a journey. Okay. Definitely a roller coaster. <laughs> um, so when I was on social media, mm. when I started, I was on the bigger side. Okay. So in clothes, I was about a size 16 between a yo-yo. So I was size 16, size 14. I was on the bigger side. Yeah. Um, that was just very bad diet. Um, a load of hormonal issues that initiated the weight gain, um, health problems, mental health problems, eating at stupid times, just doing what I want when I want, seafood diet. <laughs> um, then a lot in my life had changed mm -hmm. after YouTube. As I said, my mental health deteriorated. Um, I basically had a breakdown. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> to, to put it out there, basically had a, a, a breakdown. Yeah. And lost all the weight. Okay. Literally just went from a size 16 to a size 10. Nice. Um, so what, what are your tips? <laughs> <laughs> Don't starve yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have a bit of a healthier diet, but um, yeah. yeah, I starved myself basically. 
Um, oh, right. Was that a kind of initial start? Yeah. yeah. I think the stress shredded it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I starved <laughs> myself. I, I didn't really eat much. And when I did, it was like once a day. Mm. Um, I was living on Red Bulls. So I had a really bad caffeine addiction. Oh, no. Which was something that I openly spoke about on social media as well, yeah. was the caffeine addiction. It that's, was, that's a big thing, you know. I see it all the time. I had a caffeine addiction from when I was about 15 or 16. Wow. Um, which caused a lot of hormonal issues with my menses and stuff like that. Because yeah. caffeine has a huge effect on your body, which I wasn't aware of. When yeah. I'm going to the corner shops and buying Boost every day before school. <laughs> Uh, when they were like 39p, those are the days. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, I cut out caffeine and didn't do it the healthiest way. So you're meant to wean yourself. Mm. You literally go cold turkey. So tremors, aches, migraines, wow. literally shaking, can't regulate your temperature, literally cold turkey. In. <laughs> so what, what is the best way to kind of, Diet, that in your experience. Not eating late at night, not mm. snacking late at night. Um, probably eating little but often, okay. rather than one meal a day, because that's what I was doing. I was basically eating one meal a day and everything was just Red Bull or Coca-Cola or whatever. Mm. Um, and just being a bit more cautious. Okay. Would you say Islam and people joining can be like a, a fashion sometimes. Yeah. In what way? It's become a trend. Yeah. It's trendy. Between, I mean, my, my, what I've seen, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of young males. Primarily, in, in, yeah. Yeah, people I've grew up, grew up with and kind of rappers and stuff like that, or people who go jail tend to join Islam. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts on that? I, mean, I don't have any thoughts. I don't. I don't see any wrong in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess it's it's become a trend, isn't it? But are they joining because it's like a like a brotherhood kind of like a community or? I think there are aspects of it that they see that they appreciate and they like. Yeah. Whether that's the actual faith side of it, I don't know. I can't really say. No, I understand, yeah, yeah. But I definitely think, especially when you're in jail, there's a lot more benefits yeah. to being Muslim in jail. <laughs> um, so that side of things. And then I guess, I mean, with my experience, when you have a good community, it is very good. Yeah. It's very good. You're looked after. You, you have a family. So that side of things, and I know with the brothers, it's a lot more brotherly. It's a lot more brotherhood. Whereas yeah. with the women, it's a bit different because we have to cater to, to husbands and families and stuff like that. Mm. So I definitely think that is a massive factor of it with the, the brotherly community. Um, I guess that's all I can say on it. <laughs> oh, fair enough, yeah. <laughs> and um, what would you say, because you've, you've lived in a household with, with different kind of religions what would you say to someone who's trying to convert who's whose family's in a different religion what would be your advice how do they make that first step how do they talk to their family um i mean i don't think i went about it the best way okay but it worked <laughs> um i mean you don't have to tell anybody yeah like you don't so at the end of the day, you do what you want to do. You do what you think is best for you, because at the end of the day, not who are your family, but who are your family. Yeah, I guess it's your own personal it's your choice. relationship with yeah, God. Yeah, it's what yeah. you want to do, it's how you want to do it. Um, but would you say there's light on the other side of the tunnel? Yeah, it's definitely perseverance. It's definitely, I think, something that was most important for me, um, because I was alone, I did a lot of studying. Yeah. I did a lot of traveling. I did a lot of, I worked in an Islamic college just to be able to have an environment to know what I was talking about, to learn the language, to learn the Quran, to, to learn. So to be able to do that, that's gonna make it easy for you to stay strong. Mm. That's gonna make it easier for you to 
know the battle that you're fighting. Yeah. So when my family did come to me with things, it's like, you can't sway me because it's, I've consciously done what I've needed to do. I've probably done more than what you've done. Yeah. I've gone to the countries to study it. I've somewhat learnt the language. I can read and I can understand the language. Wow. How many of you can say that you've done that in Hebrew? Yeah. None of you. No, it's true. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, that is one thing that I would say to anybody is don't just come to it and go and sit in the mosque and go and sit with a group of girls cause you wanna, or guys because you want to have that. Go and learn. Yeah. Go and read. There's too many books. There's too many YouTube videos. There's, I mean, actually, be mindful of who you watch on YouTube. I'm going to put that out there. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> learn. But, but do your research. Yeah, yeah get clued research. up. Learn. Yeah. Like, there's so much of a bigger picture than being Muslim, praying, going to Mecca, knowing about the Prophet Muhammad, so Solomon, and Arabic. There's so much more. Mm. And there's so much more to just dressing to look like a Muslim. Yeah. Which yeah. I think that was a big thing for me. Like I felt like I had to wear the veil. I felt like I had to cover and put gloves on. And there's so much more to that okay, right, than right. that, shall I say. Yeah. Not that that is wrong. But it's, it's just dependent on your own. It depends on you. Yeah. At the end of the day, I could sit here and wear the veil all day long and cover my face and cover my hands and have this conversation and not be praying and still be a bad person and still be drinking alcohol going around and doing these things, or I could literally not wear a hijab at all mm. and do all the things that I'm meant to be doing. It's, yeah. it's not what you look like. And that's, that's the misconception is that, oh, you're extreme or you're this sort of person because of the way you cover. Yeah. No. No, that's, that's a good answer. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that we ask everyone. Go on. What inspires you? Ooh. <laughs> what inspires me? No. <laughs> like on the day to day, what inspires you in life? Like what keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? <laughs> <laughs> um, or do you have any role models? No. No? It's quite deep what I want to say, that's why I'm thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Um, Yeah, I've got to <laughs> Probably what inspires me is the fact that I am still here mm. and I probably shouldn't, not shouldn't. There was a time that I may not have made it to be here. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. So... I think being close to death and not dying and then realising that you actually don't want to die is probably the biggest thing that inspires me to, to make sure that whatever I do, I do it with purpose. Or try to do it with purpose, anyway. Wow. No, I understand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, it's another question we asked everyone. Do you, do you believe in any, in, in any conspiracies? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah? Which one? Um, do I speak about this? <laughs> um, I actually speak about one that we, not recently had, but the last yeah. one that we had was about the moon, I okay. think, and about the earth being flat. I'm still not sure about the earth being flat, so I'm not going to go <laughs> into it. And we're you, not going to do so this. So you're going to be a flat earther? I don't know, I don't know. And do you know what's weird? I don't even care. I don't care if it's flat, round. What difference does it make? I'm here. But um, we had a debate yeah. about the moon. Is that about the moon landing? Or no, just the moon about in general? the moon not being a physical oh, thing that okay. can be walked on. Okay. Okay. And obviously, me being me, I'm not just going to go by the conspiracy theory. I'm going to take it to Islam and I'm going to go to the books and try and find out what the situation is. Okay. So within this debate, was it a debate or was it like a healthy conversation? Discussion. A discussion yeah. that we was having. Mm. I said, right, be right back. Went to the books and I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, <laughs> so it described the moon in, is in Islam, in the Quran, of being, um, I can't remember fully. No, that, that was space. Mm. Um, it was about the moon basically being not a, in layman's term, like not a physical thing, yeah. but it being a light slash a reflection. Okay, which is right. what our debate was about, is that the moon is not a physical thing. It's actually, I can't remember the, the scientific word, the proper word for it. So it was like, okay, so it was more like a reflection. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the second thing that we had a debate about was space not being this just space and that just empty with no oxygen. Um, <sighs> And that it's actually a place with water. Okay, right. Um, <clears throat> so in Islam, we should know that meteors came and brought the water. So the okay, is that what we believe? Yeah. Okay, right, yeah. Um, I mean, not everybody knows this. So I guess you've got to look it up. Mm. Um, and we was having the debate about space and being in water. Me again. I said, BRB, went away, mm. looked at the book and said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it actually says that it describes the, the solar system as swimming. All right. Not floating, not, Orbiting. it says we are swimming. Yeah, wow. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, well, if you're doing up conspiracy, I guess you could take that as however you want to take it. Me being a person of faith and believing in Allah, believing in God. I don't know how else I can take that. Mm. So basically, I took myself back to the conspiracy theorist <laughs> and said, all right, I agree with you. <laughs> this is what the Quran says. You got that <laughs> cool, one. we're going to run with that. Um, but yeah, the flat earth one, I'm a bit like, eh. Don't really know. I'm not too I'm not sure. Not too sure on that. And it doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if the earth's flat or round. It's not making yeah. any difference. I ain't gonna fall off. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think that's a wrap. <laughs> what What are your socials for everyone? Um, everything is based on the social. So, Lamia Gram, Lamia Talk, Lamia Snap. And for the question. Uh, Urban yeah. Equestrian Academy. UEA, South London. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much. That's all right, thank you. <laughs>